So welcome back to Zoo 3649. This is lecture 32. Uh, we're on the topic of speciation. How are species formed? And I've just started the first lecture with you. Um, the last lecture uh, was about um, basic ideas of how we get from genes with small, small, small changes in time leads to species. Small changes at allele frequencies. Classically. Okay, so now we are going to extend that classical view and I'm going to talk about the different modes of speciation, the way we classically learned it. And what I mean by classical, when, when, you, when you hear something like classical in science, it means that's the old way of thinking, okay? The classical way of thinking. That is the way that the guys who came before us were thinking, okay? Um, and so I give you this classical view because this is the view of speciation that we've all learned at high school, okay? That is the way of speciation that I, when I was your age, I also learned this classical view, okay? And I'm giving you the classical view. Why? Because the classical view is being dismantled, okay? We actually now, things have changed since I was your age. Now, since that time, we have a modern view. And of course, we're going to be talking about that in the next lectures, right? There's a modern view to speciation, which is different from this classical view I'm going to tell you about today, okay? But in order to tell you about the modern view, we first got to iron out the classical view. And ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be examined in your tests, in your exam. You will have to be able to differentiate what the classical view of speciation is and what the modern view of speciation and what the big differences are between the two views okay i'm just giving you a warning this will be examined so please put your thinking caps on and hold on for the ride all right so let's let's talk about how and in fact this is really brushing up on your high school right because this is uh this is what we've all been taught uh when we were young the classical view of speciation and so let's study speciation in the how does new species originate okay how can we understand the origin of species remember darwin's book on natural selection was called the origin of species by means of natural selection okay but the origin of species that has always been a question that has intrigued biologists and today it's still intriguing biologists much of my own personal research is on the origin of species and how speciation works okay and so that is a question that has always tormented the best of us biologists from lowly old moodly at Univen and all the way to Darwin 200 years ago that was the question that tormented uh, biologists and we still want to know okay how species evolve we know that there are species okay we know that just look around there are species we are a species the question is how did we get here how did we evolve what was the mechanism the underneath the underlying molecular mechanisms what forces led to the evolution of species okay what was the mechanism so classically the mechanism for creating species was geography okay so this is now the classical view i'm talking to you about the classical view was on geographical criteria to classify four modes of speciation Okay, so you know what these classical four modes of speciation are, right? Using geographic criteria. Okay, and here they are. We go, there's allopatric, okay, speciation, where you have one population, a barrier in between, and then they're isolated, and then the two, uh, if they come back into contact, they are unable to breed. They are two different species. Okay they'll become different because they were isolated, all right? Then there's peripatric speciation, and this was something Ernst Meyer came up with all by himself. And peripatric speciation is when you, it's very similar to allopatric speciation, when you have a barrier between two populations, except that one population is 
very small. Okay, and in peripatric speciation, because one population is very small, remember what force of evolution is going to hammer that population when it's small? Obviously, it's drift. Okay, so peripatric speciation relies on very high genetic drift in one of the populations, and so the high genetic drift will make it that population speciate much more quickly. It'll make it different from its parent population very quickly. Okay, so that, and of course, it also it involves isolation between the small population and the parent population and eventually when they are not isolated they cannot reproduce together because why they've already become different species okay and the uh, third method or classical method is parapatric speciation and that is when the you have one parental population and you actually have the uh, two populations um, not fully distinct from each other. Geographically, they still have an overlap in their geographic range, okay? And yet, even with the geographical overlap, so they're both found at some part of their range, they're both found together. But nevertheless, speciation occurs, okay? And in that situation, speciation occurs by non-random mating or sexual selection. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail during the rest of this lecture. And a more extreme case of the parapatric speciation is sympatric speciation, where actually you have complete overlap of two populations, and you still, they still evolve into different species. Or so. so this is really the opposite of allopatric, okay? Allopatric means they're separated. That's why there's no gene flow. That's why they become uh, separate species. Sympatric is saying, no, 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 they're in the same place. And still they become different species, okay? And sympatric speciation is also facilitated by non-random mating, the same as parapatric speciation is. In fact, it is simply a more extreme case parapatric speciation. So here are your four classical modes of speciation and every one of these modes you've already studied in second year, you studied in first year, and you studied at school, right? If your biology teacher was good enough, you got this at school. It's part of the metric curriculum. So, so that is the classical view that everybody knows, all right? And what is the, dif what defines these four modes is geographic position of the populations okay in allopatric they're separated in peripatric they're separated in parapatric they're not fully separated and in sympatric they are not separated at all they're completely overlapping all right so they are all four have some kind of geographic uh, separation okay but all four ideas in this classical view are based on the same concept and what is that concept to reduce gene flow, okay? The populations, even if they are overlapping or completely overlapping, like in sympatric populations, you still have to get rid of gene flow, okay? And in overlapping and completely overlapping populations, that's done, of course, by non-random mating, where the members of one population do not consider the others as mates, okay? They do not select the others as mates. So in other words, a kind of sexual selection which keeps the two populations apart, even though they are both running around in the same place, okay? They are able to meet each other, but they don't recognize each other as mates, okay? So all of these classical, classical views, whether it's allopatric, parapatric, sympatric, uh, para parapatric, all of them, are based on the same concept. Gene flow must be reduced. There can be no genetic exchanges because as soon as there's a genetic exchange, what happens? You don't get speciation, right? You get the populations becoming the same. Speciation, we want the population to become different. So they must be isolated somehow, even if they are completely geographically overlapping. They still have to be isolated. They have to have non-random mating, okay? So the classical view, the defining feature of the classical view is to reduce gene flow.
if you can reduce gene flow, you will get species. That is what Ernst Meyer and Theodosius Dobzhansky said. That was their classical view, the Meyerian view of speciation. To get species, you must get rid of gene flow. Because gene flow will make them the same. Species means that they've become, speciation means they're becoming different. So you can't have gene flow. Because if you have gene flow, they won't become different. They will remain the same. Okay? And that's the idea. Okay? That is the classical view hinges upon that concept to reduce gene flow. Because gene flow was always thought to result in offspring that were less fit than either of the parents. Okay? So when I'm asking you, what is the classical view of speciation? The classical view is to reduce gene flow. Because if you don't reduce gene flow, things don't become different. They become the same, right? And on top of that, when you do have gene flow between two species, what happens, right? Usually, the classical Meyerian view is that the, the hybrid, the, 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 the progeny, the, the child that is born when two species mate, okay, is not fit. It has a lower fitness compared to the parents. Because the parent may be adapted to one environment, okay, and the and the uh, uh, other parent is adapted to another environment, like these lions and tigers. Lions are from Africa, and they're adapted to a certain environment. Tigers are adapted to a jungle environment, okay, from Asia. So, what happens when you mate these two? You get what is called a liger, okay? You get an uh, it, it's a massive animal, as you see. It's bigger than a lion and it's bigger than a tiger. But what is the problem with the liger? Okay? There is selection against this hybrid because it's a hybrid between species. It's an interspecific hybrid. And Ernst Meyer's idea was that, is that if you get an animal, <laughs> look at the size of this animal, if you get a hybrid between two species, its fitness will be reduced. And look at this animal. You can see immediately that it's not, even though it's big, but big doesn't mean fitter, right? In the evolutionary sense. Big means this one can't hide from its prey. It can't sneak up on its prey. Big means that this one is unable to move fast enough to catch its prey. So just because it's big doesn't mean it's, it's, it's fit, right? Not from an evolutionary point of view. Fitness from our point of view in evolution, fitness is basically what? Being able to survive the struggle for existence and produce offspring that are able to survive on the, the struggle for existence, okay? So this animal, the liger, will not be able to do that. Therefore, it has a low fitness, right? So basically... It's coming down to Dobzhansky's biological species concept, which assumes that species are reproductively isolated. So when they come together and they produce an offspring, right, like this thing, it has a low fitness, okay? It has a low fitness because of reproductive isolation, okay? Because lions and tigers were isolated for such a long time that they've got mutations that are not shared with each other. And now they've come together and you can hybridize. You can produce this liger even. But that liger is sterile. That liger cannot produce infants of its own. Okay? Because of reproductive isolation already be happen becoming established between lions and tigers. Okay. So that is the idea. That is the classical view. Right? You reduce gene flow, you get species. If you have gene flow between species, fitness is low. That can never lead to another species, okay? Because fitness is always low, right? That is the classical view in a nutshell. I'm going to give you some examples very quickly because this is, um, but as I said, this is high school level work, okay? We're not in third year to do high school level work. So I'm going to give you some quick examples of the four modes of classical modes of speciation. And in the next lecture, we're going to start with a modern the modern view of speciation, okay? So, um, in the allopatric situation, you have gene flow that is uh, prevented or it is uh, messed up, 
right? So this can result in two ways. So in other words, allopatric speciation, you must have isolated populations. This isolation can occur thanks to variants, vicariants, sorry. So uh, in, in one species range, you could have maybe a river change its course and is now flowing right through the middle of the species range and it's isolating the two halves of the species, right? This is a vicariance model and eventually, uh, because there's no gene flow, you will get two different species. Or you could have the dispersal mo uh, model where you have one species uh, and another and a small pocket of them migrate across a barrier, manage to get across a barrier, but they can't cross back. And so now there's no gene flow. And what happens in this case? You have two different species forming. Okay, this is the allopatric speciation and the populations then undergo uh, divergence. They become uh, they have different uh, selection pressures. They independently undergo genetic drift and different mutations are not shared between the populations and they eventually become reproductively isolated and they cannot exchange genes anymore. OK, this is allopatric speciation. Example is um, of these owls, the spotted owls. Uh, along the Rocky Mountains. And if you are not familiar with this part of North America, here's the United States here. This is Canada, this is Mexico, and this is the United States here. And there's the Rocky Mountains in between here. And those mountains are an allopatric barrier to these owls. They can't fly in between these mountains. And so what has happened on either side of the mountains, we have two different species evolving. Another classic example is uh, when this uh, here, you see my mouse this is a place called panama okay and that was actually open 3.5 million years ago okay and what because that was that open that was open 3.5 million years ago the sea could flow between south america and north america through this channel here but what happened three and a half million years ago the sea level raised there was tectonic tectonic activity and the land rose and so suddenly the sea could not the sea could not flow between these two oceans and what happened they, that created a barrier for these fish and on this side uh, the the fish evolved into one species and on the other side the pork fish evolved into another species because why there's an allopatric barrier here when the isthmus of Ch uh, panama closed three and a half million years ago so that's classical allopatric speciation what about peripatric speciation as i said very similar to allopatric but one of the populations is small so um when a population is small what force of evolution is happening mostly on that population you guessed it it's genetic drift okay so this speciation is like allopatric speciation except in one of the populations genetic drift has a much higher influence because that population is small so what will happen the populations will diverge much much more quickly right the populations diverge and you know this you know this the populations diverge at a rate of 1 divided by 2 n so if n the population size is small the population will diverge very quickly okay and that's the cl the key to peripatric speciation one population is very small and that population are the founders okay the founders for example in this the founders of these flies they reach an island right they reach an island five flies reach an island okay um here is the frequency spectrum of the genes and you see that these some of them have a high number of these rare genes in, 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 in red and black, like this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here. The others don't, but by chance, some have these rare alleles. What will happen if there's only five in five founders here? It will mean that genetic drift, because it's, N is only equal to five, quickly, genetic drift will fix these rare alleles in the population. Okay? It will make them it will give it basically it will mean all the alleles then are these rare alleles in the population and very soon the flies in this island would have diverged so quickly from the mainland flies from which they come and they have such a different allele frequency spectrum with all these red 
um, green and now yellow rare alleles and the mainland flies do not have them so what happens they become very different and they're unable because this one has so many different alleles to this one because why of genetic drift that now they are unable to re to breed with each other and they become different species okay so this is peripatric speciation it was originally proposed by Ernst Meyer because genetic drift plays a very large low role in fixing the alleles that lead to reproductive isolation. And a classic example of that is the evolution of the polar bear. Okay, the polar bear is basically an offshoot of a few founding brown bears. Okay, so the polar bear population was um, was founded by from a brown bear population that became a small brown bear population that became isolated okay and then those those brown bears genetic drift fixed the white color and it just so happens that those white colored bears were very good at living where in the snow okay so those bears started living in the snow becoming many right and they were unable to mate properly with their brown relatives because why only a few became white very quickly genetic drift fixed the white color okay due to the founder effect and then now they are not isolated anymore you find that they are unable to breed with each other properly okay so so the polar bear and the brown bear are one of those classical cases of peripatric speciation or genetic drift or founder effect <coughs> so let's lead take us to the last two and these last two are the interesting ones why because the first two there's a barrier right doesn't matter even in peripatric speciation one one population is small there's still a barrier in me in other words there's no gene flow across the barrier and therefore you will have speciation but what about these last two sections? These last two sections, they don't have a geographic barrier, do they? They don't have a geographic barrier. Because you know that in parapatric speciation, there is a contact zone. There is some overlap between the two populations that are going to become different species. Okay? So you could have a contact zone because of unequal distribution or dispersal. Uh, the barrier is not complete. The geographic barrier so there may be a slight barrier but it's not complete or uh, the divergence of expressions of animal behavior some animals simply like to wander into these areas but in such cases okay how can gene flow be prevented because all these concepts need gene flow to be present prevented but in these two para parapatric and 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 sympatric the next one gene flow is still restricted why how does gene flow get restricted when there is no geographic barrier and that is through what we call non-random mating and unequal gene flow okay so basically non-random mating when when one species mates uh, w w mates only with other members that look just like them so they are choosing their partners and what they are not choosing the partners they're not choosing the partners of the others the other population and so even though they both exist in the same place there's no gene flow between them and so what happens with no gene flow under the classical model you will get speciation as soon as you stop gene flow you will get speciation Okay, so speciation is the end result, even though they are not completely geographically isolated. Another way, here's an example, and this is a South African example, because uh, you can see the first steps of peripatric speciation occurring in grass species. So some of these, we have a lot of mines, especially in Joburg area, we have gold mines. Have you ever been to Johannesburg? Um, they're becoming rarer these days, but you see those small hills they are actually former gold mines okay and what happens how do you get gold out of the soil 
you have to put many harsh chemicals into the soil to leach the gold out okay and so these hard, heavy chemicals heavy metals for example um, they plants don't like growing in them okay not all plants can grow in them only some plants can grow in them okay and so what happens in these mines okay is the plants that are growing there they've actually already undergone natural selection okay so they have a tolerance for these heavy metals whereas the plants that are growing beside the mine okay they have not undergone that selection so they don't have this tolerance for heavy metals okay they don't because they do not live in the polluted soil but what has happened over time is that in the mines right because they are now adapted to the heavy metals they also have their mating season in other words their flowering season how do plants mate through flowers right flowers are the sex organs of plants so when there's when the flowers come up is the only time plants can exchange genes with other plants the wind blows the pollen and it goes to another plant right so only when they are flowering can they have gene flow right so now what happens in the mine where you have the plants that are uh, um, evolved for the mine waste okay sorry my, my, my picture is there it says mine waste okay so what happens in the situation here where you have the plants evolved to the mine waste they could flower at a different time compared to the uncontaminated plants and what happens now what happens now when this one does not flower at the same time as these ones even though they are they are almost overlapping in their range they are in the same place what happens no gene flow right because the plants if you flower at a different time these plants while these plants are flowering here these ones here cannot receive their pollen because they don't have flowers and when these ones start flowering the flowers here are gone so these ones cannot get the genes of those ones and they cannot exchange their genes because they are flowering at different times and that's another way to have non-random mating that's another way that these ones are now only going to mate wet with themselves because they have the flowers at the same time these ones can't mate with them and so when you stop the gene flow you stop the mating what happens speciation okay and so this is how parapatric speciation happens even though they are in the same area they can have no gene flow thanks to non-random mating and sympatric speciation is basically the extreme version of that right when a new species evolves from an ancestral species while both two new species are in the same geographic region okay so um the challenge of course is to still be able to reduce gene flow while inhabiting the same geographic distribution so the you would think well how is that even possible prof if you live in the same place the very same place and uh you are one population how do you become two populations while living in the same space the mechanisms for sympatric speciation are actually unclear okay uh, there are only very few examples where we can say this was a product of sympatric speciation okay because in that situation it's very difficult to have no gene flow at all okay while inhabiting the same area okay and the only way to do this is again through non-random mating or by sexual selection where individuals actually choose to mate with each other and not with the others because um, and so thus the gene flow between the two populations even though they're in the same area they're not mating with each other because they don't see the other one as a mate they only see their own as a mate okay and that is the way sympatric speciation a is able to reduce the gene flow okay there are actually very few example horseshoe bats are one that they're thought to uh, speciate sympatrically by changing their call their mating call okay so then the female bats hear a particular call and then they only want to hear that call and so if you change your call slightly 
the females don't respond to you anymore. Okay? If you change your call slightly, only the females in your population respond to your call. So you could have the same ancestral population of bats flying in the same place, but slight changes in the call, and immediately the females are mating non-randomly. Okay? And then eventually that could lead to sympatric speciation. Okay? Cichlid fishes in, in our African lakes here uh, may also have evolved uh, sympatrically again via sexual selection where females only choose a particular looking male okay so even though there are many males f swimming in the same place she can mate with any of them but she doesn't she mates with a particular one and another female makes with the mates only with the other particular one and so therefore even though they are in the same place they can mate with each other but they don't because they don't prefer they prefer specific kind of phenotype and they don't just prefer anything okay so that's how non-random mating can lead to speciation sympatric speciation in fact it's the only way that you can get sympatric speciation okay through non-random mating okay and that brings us briefly now to the idea of reproductive isolation i did go through this idea with you um in the last lecture by saying that eventually right most species will actually become reproductively isolated and it will make them it make it impossible to exchange genes if they ever come back into contact and if they ever come back into contact we call that process secondary contact okay because the primary thing was divergence and the secondary thing is now they've become species put them into secondary contact and they can't exchange genes that means they've become reproductively isolated so the development of reproductive isolation is a key aspect to understanding the modern view of speciation okay because these mechanisms are heritable features body form functioning or behavior something that prevents gene flow okay so for example a, a, a decrease in fitness in a hybrid like that liger okay that even though they the lion and the tiger mated there's no real gene flow because why that offspring cannot mate okay so that offspring will die without mating and therefore there's no real gene flow even though they have mated and produced an offspring that offspring will not produce offspring of its own so that offspring has no fitness okay that's why there's no actual gene flow while there's mating there's no actual gene flow okay so there are different kinds of reproductive isolation mechanisms. Prezygotic isolation means that mechanisms take into take effect before or during fertilization. Okay? So fertilization cannot happen. Okay? There's already something and these are old mechanisms, right? So um, fertilization itself cannot happen. So the, 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 the lion and the tiger, that's not pre-zygotic isolation. That is what, that's post-zygotic, when the mechanism reproductive isolation takes effect after fertilization. So in other words, post-zygotic, so the lion and tiger can still mate, but after fertilization, the, hy the hybrid is sterile, okay? So they may still be able to mate with each other when they come into secondary contact, but the fitness cost in terms of time, energy, and lost reproductive opportunities means that the fitness of the hybrids is so low that, that those hybrids cannot have offspring of their own. Okay? So that is, the, that is your post-zygotic post, um, uh, uh, reproductive isolation. Okay? And so the idea is that Selection should drive pre-zygotic mechanisms to prevent the chances of secondary contact. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. To pre prevent secondary contact. So, when does reproductive isolation actually develop? Yeah, uh, they evolve at different rates in different species. And this is the key, guys, okay? There's no golden rule that says 
reproductive isolation takes 1 million years to evolve or 2 million years or 500,000 years or 1,000 years or whatever. There is no rule like that. There's no one size fits all to the answer. What is a species? Okay, so that is why we have no answer to the question. What is a species? Because reproductive isolation in every case develops on its own time frame. Okay, so in order to understand what a species is, we have to understand how reproductive isolation actually establishes. Okay, so each population is undergoing different evolutionary forces. Each evolutionary force is changing the allele frequencies at any time. So the rate of development of reproductive isolation is different for different species. Okay, and it depends on the level of gene flow. So these mechanisms, uh, because reproductive isolation is in different stages for every species, some is some are complete, some are incomplete. Okay, that's why there is no answer to the question, what is a species? The real answer is, well, it depends. Okay, and the classical case of incomplete de development of re incomplete development of reproductive isolation in two species are our wildebeest species in Africa and South Africa. We are lucky to have both species: the black wildebeest, that is the animal from the high felt, and the blue wildebeest, that is the animal from our low felt. Okay, and these two are separated by over a million years. They diverged a million years ago. Okay. So they are quite different to each other, okay? But what happens if you put them together in the same farm? They will produce an animal like this, a hybrid, but a hybrid with a high fitness, okay? This hybrid has a high fitness because it can have offspring of its own. Now, here is a case where the biological species concept is completely violated okay remember the biological species concept said that if two species can hybridize and they have a offspring with a high fitness then they are one species right that's what Dobzhansky's biological species concept says however this case this African case here that I'm showing you shows you very clearly we can have two species these are not one species we know that this black wildebeest is different a different species to this blue wildebeest they are separated for a million years they are different species and yet they are able to have a fertile hybrid a hybrid with high fitness because why the reproductive isolation has not become fully developed between these two so a million years was not enough in this case to develop reproductive isolation okay a million years was not enough. In other cases, a million years is enough. But in the case of the Villabias, it was not enough. All right. And that leads us to our modern view of speciation, which we'll be talking about in the next lecture.